Thank you, Luke. Can you guys hear me okay? I always have that voice of God fear, you know, that it's, it's going to boom through the crowd. And At, at any rate, um, great to be here. Uh, it was beautiful, cold, but beautiful. And there were an amazing number of babies on the plane flying in at midnight. I don't understand that. Maybe somebody could explain it to me. But um, there will be a bunch of stuff on the screen, so you don't have to look at me, and I don't have to be nervous. Uh, fundamentally, everybody wants to know, okay, who, where, where did you come from? Uh, so I'm a Silicon Valley guy, but I'm living in Austin. I've been in, in Texas now for four years, helped uh, build a product organization at Rackspace, and recently rejoined a, uh, a company that I helped found in 2005, uh, roughly 10 years before the market was there. And uh, so that was a really rough eight years, and now they caught the market. And uh, so I've rejoined the company to build a product organization there. It's a company called All Clear ID. Um, it does data breach remediation. It's to ma help manage the customer service event of a data breach. You've heard of some of our customers, Sony, Home Depot, <laughs> those kinds of folks that are really struggling with what's going on in the market today. Uh, problem solving is my life, and I'm sure it's your lives as well. Uh, so what I wanted to do is walk you through uh, a, a framework that I developed at Rackspace, um, which is really the culmination of a lot of work that I've done over the last many, many years. Super fun this morning, uh, two espressos in, but still not awake. I walked outside and there was no taxi. And uh, there was a friendly looking fellow there who I, I, I said, hey, you look like a smart guy. <laughs> Are you going to the Innovation Game Summit? He's like, sure. I said, can I have a ride? Turns out we all know each other. Like half the people in this room and I have worked with almost the same people in some form or another. So it's really great to be among friends, I have to say. Uh, so you know, each of us is on the hook every day uh, to solve problems ranging you know, from the trivial to the intractable. Uh, as we approach these problems, you know, we, we often find that you know, after we've expended an extraordinary amount of time and energy solving them, they, they pop back up again, you know, kind of rearing their ugly heads, and, uh, and, and we're not quite sure what to do about them. And it turns out that the issue there is that, the pro that most problems are not problems at all, right? Uh, we call a lot of things problems, but the idea is that um, you know pro the word problem itself is a highly overloaded term. We use it for almost everything, and that's really what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about unpacking. Uh, these these will be available later too, so you don't f have to feel compelled to take pictures of them. But don't take pictures of me; <laughs> I'll be very nervous. Um, but the idea is that the the term problem is is overloaded uh, in a way that makes it very difficult for us to think through the diagnostics necessary to understand what strategies to put in place to solve them when they're solvable, or not solve them when they're not. Uh, so. Something, I don't know, have any of you taken PQ&A from Dennis Matthews? Um, it's a fantastic, fantastic workshop on, on how to have much smarter uh, conversations by asking and answering questions better. He runs a company called Vervago. Uh, I'm, if, if you haven't had an opportunity to, uh, to take his workshop, I highly recommend it. Um, but one of the things that he, uh, that, you know, that, he, that he walks us through is that you know, the word problem itself assumes that there's a problem, right? And it, the, you know, when somebody says, you know what the problem is, that assumes there's only one problem, right? And, uh, and it also uh, assumes that you're in the right category of problem. And so this, most of this uh, discussion is going to be around uh, problem categorization for the purposes of, of effective diagnostic thinking. And I have a couple stories around that. And what I want to do is walk you through how I've used this recently in rejoining a company that I was absent for eight years while they built a lot of technical debt. Um, and I've stepped back in and had to quickly decode in kind of six weeks, figure out everything that's going on with the technology, with the market, with the customers, figure out what we're going to do to build our way to the future. So the framework rests on, um, it's a super simple framework. It rests on sort of two uh, key ideas. One is that you know, when, when something happens that's problematic, the impact of it happening um, you know, has a scale. And so I want to look at you know, the, the on, on the low end of that scale, the impact is small. And I'm not looking at kind of severity probability like we usually talk about those things. I want to change the language a little bit and talk about it in terms of impact. Um, and on, 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 on the high side of impact, there's epic. And you'll see why I use that, that term a little later. Uh, and the, the, the thing about um, impact is as it goes up, core assumptions get challenged and stable processes fall away. So the things that we've come to rely on in terms of our understanding uh, don't apply in ways that we expect, which makes problem solving very nonlinear as, as, the, uh, as the, the problem, uh, as the impact of the problem gets larger and larger and larger. 
On the other side, uh, there's difficulty to solve, which is kind of a relative thing, right? Because as one friend of mine pointed out, look, if you, if you have um, you know, multiple millions of dollars in your transmission and your car dies, you just go get a Tesla, right? And uh, if you don't have a lot of money, you may lose your job and you may end up out of your house. So the difficulty to solve may be relative to the resources that you're able to bring to bear, even if it's the very same problem. In, in effect. So I want to be uh, sensitive to, uh, to the fact that there are lots of different forces that apply when it comes to difficulty to solve. And part of what Luke was talking about earlier related to the multidimensional nature uh, of, of problems is that, you know, look, this is a model, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. It's only as useful as it is applicable in your work, in your worlds. And uh, I find this particularly helpful for me, and you'll see why. Uh, but I'm not trying to preach gospel on problem solving or diagnostic thinking here. What I'm trying to do is give you a framework to think about things in a slightly different way than you might have been thinking about them before. So I think I already said that. Uh, no, maybe I didn't. Uh, so as difficulty to solve goes up, um, system dynamics uh, tend to, uh, to be at play. Other factors such as uh, understandability, right? social context and politics, there are all sorts of factors. As difficulty goes up, these other factors tend to start creeping in in ways that makes it very, very hard. Um, at, the, at the point that something is unsolvable, right? it may be because you have a lot of interrelated or, or conflicting imperatives around right? the needs of the many versus the needs of the few, you know, Spock, all that. And, you know, it gets complicated, and complicated in ways that aren't necessarily un unwindable because sometimes the, the dynamics are so complicated, and there's so many of them that, uh, that it's simply, I, I put this into the category of whatever you're working on is unsolvable. So you need a strategy for dealing with something that's unsolvable. So the, the purpose behind effective categorization in this regard is that uh, words help us think more clearly. And when we're using better words to describe the world that we're living in and the, the symptoms that we're facing and the problems that they may represent, the more effective we're going to be able to, uh, to sort of approach that thing and communicate it about it with other people and unpack it or um, put it in a context that helps us deal with it uh, in a more effective way. So I want to tell you about a little story. Um, I've got a couple of stories just to, to, to make this point. Like something that from an impact point of view is small and from a difficulty to solve is trivial, right, would be an issue. And an issue by, in effect, by definition, doesn't need to be solved. Uh, date night, a couple months ago, I was driving home with uh, my very lovely wife, Kirsten, and she turns to me and she says, after a whole meal of Chinese food, I'm pregnant. Now, I'm shocked because I can't figure out how she got pregnant. She sees the shock on my face and uh, then says, oh, Harry, I was just teasing you. I, I fell in love with another dog, and I, I would really like to get a puppy. <laughs> and so this is Cody, the newest member of our family. And it occurs to me, I just had an issue, right? Because that dog was going to show up at our house whether I wanted it or not. <laughs> And I love dogs, I love animals, and uh, Cody's turned out to be just an absolute delight. I didn't have a problem to solve, and it wasn't worse than a problem. It turned out to be an issue, and I was very, very happy that, uh, well, we don't need to go into anything more about that particular story, but um, <laughs> Cody's lovely. As, as impact goes up, right, and as difficulty to solve goes up, uh, we get to dilemma. And a dilemma, in effect, is a, is a type of problem, but it's a simple type of problem. That is to say, all you have to do to solve it is make a decision, right? You have to make a decision and then move on. And the idea there is that there isn't typically a ton of work to do. There are probably a set of variables, probably a set of criteria. There's probably a process you need to walk through to get to a point where you have some options and you can make a provisional decision and then you can try it out or live with it for a little bit and then lock it down and go. A lot of people conflate problems and dilemmas, and they don't realize that a dilemma is just, it's an instance of a conflicting imperative, right? A dilemma is just two, but a conflicting imperative, may, you may be a lot of them, but still, fundamentally, it's just a decision-making process. At the end of the day, you decide whether or not you're going to buy the Tesla, or whatever you're going you're gonna to buy. Maybe it's the, the new Golf from Volkswagen that doesn't go as far. Um, and as it gets more problematic, as the impact goes up, as difficulty to solve goes up, I actually look at it in terms of a, a, an actual problem. And uh, I think a great story to sort of underlie these two concepts um, 
I don't know, three or four months ago, my, I, I have a stepson, um, and he got diagnosed with something called pectus um, excavatum. Uh, it's a, um, a genetic defect where uh, the breastbone uh, doesn't grow out uh, as it's supposed to, and it puts a lot of pressure on the heart and lungs. And it has, this, you know, it can be like really mild and can do nothing more than cause psychological damage, you know, so the kid won't take his shirt off and go swimming with all his friends and won't go into a public shower and, you know, do all the things that a boy needs to do. Or it can be really, really serious. And um, really serious means putting pressure on uh, the, the, uh, the heart, means putting pressure on the lungs, um, and uh, means, you know, lack of endurance. It means um, sort of a severe deformation in a way that, you know, really affects the child's um, self-concept, uh, and you know, from a you know from a from a from a dilemma to problem point of view, the the way I think about this is like for us, like we got the information that we need of as parents, we have to make a decision about what we're going to do. It's a simple decision at this point, right? It's not his decision. I mean, we're going to take his input, we're going to take the doctor's input, we're going to take the insurance's input, and then we're going to make a decision. So for us, it's a dilemma: do we do it or not? There's a lot of risk, right? They have to cut open the side, they put a titanium bar in, they turn it around, it pushes the chest out. It is incredibly painful, but success rate, very, very high. And it, it solves the physical problems, it solves largely the psychological problems, and uh, people go on to live very happy, healthy lives after this incredibly invasive surgery. Um, from his point of view, we couldn't figure out why he wouldn't go swimming, right? Because he wasn't taking his shirt off, but as he went into high school, there was a mandatory uh, physical, and the doctor said, take your shirt off, and he took his shirt off, and the doctor was like, you know, Kirsten, have you, I mean, have you seen this? And she was horrified, because she realized, I mean, this thing shows up in puberty. It had happened quickly, like a year or two. She hadn't noticed, because he was dressing and undressing as a budding teenager in his room with his door closed and wasn't going swimming, so he wasn't really disclosing things to us, and now she's got a problem. Right now, I have a problem, and uh, it's a big problem. Um, and as we're learning more and more about it, we're, we're realizing it's, it's solvable, and um, it's expensive, uh, and expensive in the way of you know, based on the severity level of this, the insurance will pay a certain amount. And so, from the insurance's point of view, you know, the the whole thing looks one way. From our perspective, it looks another way. From Terry's perspective, it looks another way. And so. The, the, the degree, the impact and, and difficulty to solve is a function of, you know, what does the doctor think? And what does the doctor, how, how, how severe does the doctor rate this? How, how is the insurance company going to read what the doctor is saying? How are we going to take that and try to make a decision? And so we're balancing out all these factors and looking at, okay, well, what do we actually have to do? And, you know, is this simply a decision we have to make and move on? Um, what aspects of this are problematic and how are we going to have to solve for them? Are there elements of this that are not solvable, which I'll talk about next, and, and what do we do about that? So predicament um, is sort of the next category up, and you know, imp impact goes up, uh, difficulty to solve goes up, and the idea around predicament is that it's in, it's in, the, um, it's in the realm of things that you cannot solve by definition. It's not solvable. It's going to keep going some way or another. Now, that doesn't mean you don't want to deal with it. It means the strategy for, uh, for, for, for approaching it is going to require something different than trying to solve it. It's going to require tr uh, managing it. Now, you, you may want to decompose it. You may want to look at what pieces of it are solvable, but they're, by its intrinsic nature, have some elements that, for some reason or another, are self-reinforcing, and therefore, they continue going on. Um, and so the, the idea that I wanted to highlight here is that when you're, when you're dealing with an issue, you cope with it. When you're dealing with a, a dilemma or a problem, you solve for it. When you're dealing with a predicament, right, you have to manage it. And what does that mean? And what's an example? And how do you know if you have one? Um, I was talking to uh, one of my former colleagues. Wes Bright was here a couple of days ago. I don't know if any of you had a chance to meet him. Uh, and, and, and I was talking to him about the presentation, and he, and he, said, he said, you know that... You know that, uh, that Jeff Foxworthy thing, like how do you know you're, you're, you know you're a redneck when, or you know you're a redneck if? He's like, well, how do you know you have one of these? <laughs> you, know, you know you have a predicament when what is true. And, um, and so I've spent the last couple of days you know, sort of pondering how to better get that across. 
And it, it gets back to the idea of, you know, there's something in it that prevents you from ever putting it to rest permanently, right? That's the difference between anything that is to the left of predicament and anything that is to the right of problem. And so the best example I could come up with that is sort of highly relevant in my life right now, maybe sort of relevant in your lives, and you'll see how impressively relevant this is in my life when I walk you through what I just stepped into rejoining this company, is the idea of technical debt, right? A technical debt's interesting, right? Because at first blush, you think, hmm, technical debt, right? You code your way out of it. You figure out what's going on, you unpack it, you rebuild it all. But how many of you have heard the term polishing marbles? Okay, so you get engineers, like super smart people, that know how to code, and they look at perfect functioning code that somebody else wrote, and they're like, it is not beautiful, right? What do you mean it's not beautiful? Well, this is not self-evident what it is supposed to do. It is not documented. And I think, okay, uh, we have these other things to build. Do you really need to fix it? Like, I cannot work with this. <laughs> it's technical debt, but it's fine. It functions great. There's nothing wrong with it. He's like, oh, I've got to rewrite it. Okay, so every piece of code that gets written by definition, if you use that frame, is technical debt. Because the next engineer that comes along is going to look at it and goes, it is not beautiful, right? Says Andre, who's on my team. And so the idea around technical debt is, yeah, sure, there, there are aspects of technical debt, which is, you know, gosh, I just showed up after all these years, and I've looked at, I've looked at the Oracle database, and I've looked at all the PL SQL code, and I'm like, why do we have PL SQL code, and why does it have business logic in it? And I'm thinking to myself, holy mother, this is not going to work. We're going to have to dig our way out of this quickly because we have to get to a point where we can scale across and scale up. That's real technical debt. And Andre looks at it and goes, I don't care about that. We'll fix that. But this stuff is not beautiful. right? And so technical debt's a great example of, in a, in a given environment, what, what a predicament is like because it does not ever go away. Therefore, you need a strategy for managing it. And the strategy for managing it in our environment is going to be we're going to, we're going to rate all this stuff and we're going to pick the things we're going to solve and we're going to pick the things we're going to allow for refactoring as we have time going forward. But those things are not going to end up on my roadmap for now. Does that make sense? Quagmire. Quagmires are lovely. They are predicaments that get worse when you try to solve them. That's when you have a, poor, a coder that is not as good as Andre. <laughs> Rewriting code that worked fine that now doesn't work fine. <laughs> well, not actually a good example, but the, the idea around a quagmire is that you know, it, it, is, it is in the category of it is not solvable as, as a whole by definition. And therefore, what needs to be true is you need a strategy of approaching it for lack of a better handle mindfully, which is to say, don't act quickly, don't act thoughtlessly, figure out how you're going to approach it and approach it carefully because everything you're going to do is going to have an effect. Sometimes even looking at it has an effect, right? And certainly when you go to try to solve it, it has an effect. And you know, the, the picture that I never put up, but I always want to put up, is George Bush on the, on the aircraft carrier deck. Problem solved, right? No, it wasn't a problem, right? Getting into Iraq and doing what we did there might have been the right thing to do. History will tell, I don't know, but the point is that declaring it a problem to be solved was actually the failure, right? It turns out that the Middle East is a quagmire for us, for anybody, right? It's not a solvable situation. It's a situation that we can approach mindfully. There are pieces of it we might be able to solve or influence, but fundamentally, our approach and anybody's approach to dealing with the complexity, the social dynamics, the politics, the economics, and all the stuff going on there, doesn't matter how much military might you have. Right? doesn't matter how much money you have. It is simply not solvable. Difficulty to solve, very, very high. Impact, if, it, if, if the pieces of it come to pass, very, very high. And we're seeing that today. Right? We're seeing ISIS. And um, we're now seeing, uh, well, anyway, I will not digress into politics. Um, it's very easy to do. Let me tell you about another story that gets to the, uh, to the next piece of this. Um, as things get to the point of unsolvable, right, completely intractable, and as they get, as the, as the impact becomes epic, and, I, and when I mean epic, I don't mean really serious, I mean epic, like life-ending. Um, the two categories that I have there are crisis and, um, and ELE. Any of you know what ELE stands for? Extinction level event, right? 
How many of you have been in a startup? A couple hands. All right. Startups have extinction level events, right? There are things you can do to avoid them. There are things you can do to have them sooner. There are things you, that are out of your control. But fundamentally, sort of the, the comical version of an extinction level event is a startup. The more serious one is related to, so like 1971, I, 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 was, I was small, really small. I had hair. I was thin. I was nice. <laughs> I didn't understand politics. And I was at elementary school in second grade with Mr. Schwichtenberg, who turned around from the chalkboard one day and said, today we're going to practice duck and cover. And like, oh, that sounds interesting. Um, my father, it turns out, was, uh, he's a theoretical plasma physicist from MIT. And um, during the 70s and 80s, was essentially the world expert in the test and measurement of thermonuclear detonation. So I'm thinking, you know, when I'm, you know, however old I was in second grade and we want to play duck and cover, she says, okay, get under your desk. I'm like, get under my desk. She says, cover your head. I'm like, cover my head. She goes up and, now this was Malibu, 35 miles sort of northwest of LA and um, right on the coast and beautiful place. Back then, not so much traffic. And she says, look, if the Russians lob a one megaton nuclear intercontinental ballistic missile to LA, we're going to duck and cover. I'm going to close the curtains. You're going to get under your desk. And when it's all over, we're going to push you all out the back of the classroom door. We're going to get you on a bus, and we're going to drive to Ventura, and everything will be fine. So I'm very excited about this, because this is really the first sort of meaningful experience of thermonuclear war that I've had. <laughs> and, and I go home, and I tug on my dad's shirt when he comes home from work, and I say, Daddy, Daddy, guess what we did today? And he's in, in you know, horn rim glasses, flat top, six foot four, very stern, long hours, uh, carries a radiation bat, you know, has a radiation badge, sleeps with a gun, has an FBI handler, and drives an unmarked car, right? As a private citizen in Malibu. <laughs> and so I, I said, I said, Dad, we did duck and cover today. He said, What's that? And I and I to told him under the desk, curtains like that. And he goes, well, That's unfortunate. <laughs> And he had this really odd look on his face. And, and, and I was like, what's wrong, Daddy? And he said, well, the Russians don't have anything that small. <laughs> How many of you recall the pictures you've seen of Hiroshima? Right, that was a 20 kiloton weapon. The effective blast radius was about two miles, right? And the theoretical one megaton ICBM that Mr. Schwichtenberg was talking about was uh, had a, would have had a blast radius of about 10 or so miles. I mean, a lot more damage, but well, Malibu was just far enough away. I was thinking we were good. But it turns out the Russian had something called the Tsar bomb, which was a five, was it 50 megatons, which had an effect, effective blast radius of uh, 600 miles. And that would have toasted San Francisco from LA. So no Ventura, no bus, no duck and cover. And none of that really mattered. And, and, and I was sitting there just in dumbstruck awe as my dad was explaining this to me. And he said, if there's a nuclear war, you don't have to worry about it. He's thinking to himself. And I'm, and I'm how old was I, right? Second grade, right? You're processing, that's not good, right? That's an extinction level event. We're done at that point. So that's the idea around an ELE. And, 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 and for things like that, it requires an entirely different approach to problem solving, because you're not solving anything, right? Detente, it went away. Like we're, dealing, we're still dealing with all these things, right? A single miss of a, of a finger on a red button and, it, and, and, and no more one megaton nuclear weapon, right? So the, the idea is that we have to plan for stuff. Did you guys know that there is a, an underground seed bank to replenish the planet in the event of a catastrophic thermonuclear war that Microsoft is invest, invested in? Right? They have buried under miles of steel and lead and all sorts of stuff a seed bank with all the seeds in the world to replenish the plants should we cook all of them in a big bonfire. That's planning. Right? That strategy is very different from just making a decision or ignoring it. And the other thing that's kind of crazy about this... Uh, about this um, uh, sort of the spectrum of, of problems is that as you go from issue to, uh, to problem to predicament to quagmire to crisis, 
our ability to cope emotionally drops. So as we climb, our ability to even look at what's going on goes down. And it becomes increasingly difficult to approach what's happening as fact. So the thing about problems, I love this next one. <laughs> the thing about problems is sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. Sometimes a problem is just a problem, and it is solvable. And sometimes things that are more serious than problems can be unpacked, and we can look at them and, and, and figure out what pieces of them do need to be addressed and, 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 and approach them in ways that aren't sort of you know, frightening and terrifying and all extinction level event like. Uh, so moving this all forward, I want to take it into a couple of, a couple of directions. One is, OK, so where do you focus, and how do you think about this? So one piece of this is when you're approaching whatever it is you're doing, how do you categorize the, the sort of the array of problems, for lack of a better term, that you're encountering. And well, th th this categorization model that I just gave you is one of them, and I'll show you how that, that's meaningful later. Another one is a super simple uh, framework for, you know, when people say, it's not a problem, it's a challenge. Well, an extinction level event ain't a challenge, right? <laughs> so the idea here is just in terms of helping to figure out where to place things, um, I, I use this chart to say, OK, problems are on the left side, and opportunities are on the right side. So let's, let's unpack the concept itself and turn it into things where you're managing downside risk or things where you're managing value creation and value capture, right? And so things where you're managing downside risk are really in the domain or the realm of problems, and things where you're managing upside uh, or value creation, those are in the realm of opportunity. And then there is an element of this, which is some of its, there are pieces of it that are visible, they're above the line, if you will, and there are pieces of it that are below the line. There are systemics that you can't see. And being clear about what's what and figuring out where to focus becomes really challenging, right? Because it's super interesting if you can find something that, you know, is it the tip of the iceberg. What does that mean, right? Tip of the iceberg means that most of it's systemic and a little bit of it is visible, right? But sometimes you don't see the iceberg. You just hit it with a ship. That means the whole thing is below the water and you just ran into it. Uh, sometimes it's all visible and, it, and customers can see it or your partners or suppliers or you can feel it, but the actual system dynamics turn out to be, oh, it's just a problem in the UI, right? It's not all that hard to solve. And so figuring out just where things actually lie in the, is it visible, is it not visible, is it really degrading value, is it, help, is it preventing us from creating value or is it, how, how does it fit in this domain? I find this, this thing helpful and as I mentioned earlier, the models are only as good as they're useful. So the idea here is don't, don't take any of this away as any form of, uh, oh, now I know everything about problems. No, all you know is a little bit more about how to categorize them a little bit more usefully based on some guy that has more tread mark on him from making mistakes doing this than you do. In the problem solving process, Right, one of, I mentioned to you earlier that as you climb up the sort of the impact and difficulty to solve, it becomes more emotionally difficult to deal with what you're finding. Uh, it also becomes more emotionally difficult for other people to deal with the things that you're bringing to them. Right, one phrase that I have found particularly helpful uh, was from this guy that I used to work with. He said, look, man, the facts are friendly. They have no emotion, right? The facts are just the facts. I mean, it turns out that ostriches don't really bury their head in the sand. That's just a picture somebody made up, or they found a dead ostrich that way, and then they now went on to scry. Who knows? Um, it's kind of morbid. Uh, but the idea here is that in in communicating, you know, the, the the symptoms or the problems that you're uncovering as you're con as you're talking to people about what's going on, something to really keep a, a, a you know the suitcase you want to handle with the you know, that you want to carry with the you know the uh, the what are, they, what are those things called? Handcuffs. You know, the handcuff suitcase is the facts are friendly. It's like when somebody goes, oh my God, we can't deal with that, right? Just say, look, man, the facts are friendly. And um, let's just deal with them as they are, not as we wish them to be. And let's just write down what we know and let's work with them. So don't underestimate the value of that particular very simple, uh, apparently trite phrase. Where I wanted to go next is that there's a, a, a super important temporal perspective to all of this. So time matters a ton, right? Because a lot of people talk about problems as if everything is happening now, right? But an extinction level event may be in the future, right? So it may be 
and, and, and ELE in the future is not a problem you have today. The problem you have today is this. Well, it also turns out that the problem you may have had or that you had may be resulting in symptoms today. So there's this whole idea of time affects how you think about what it is you're dealing with when it comes to problem solving. And so what I want to walk you through is a, a set of um, problems that aren't problems from a temporal perspective. The most obvious one of which is the long fuse, which is it is essentially a time bomb, and the fuse may or may not have been lit, but the question is where, if it comes true, how big is the impact and how difficult will it be to solve? So giving it a name like, hey man, we've got a time bomb, a ticking time bomb, you, you guys have heard that, right? Um, I just say it's a long fuse. The, the fuse is getting shorter on this one. We're running out of time, right? So the challenge with, um, with time delay or long fuse issues is that the reason they're often there is because something in the system is creating rewards that support the activities or the decisions that allow them to continue happening or festering. And so it's super important to get a handle on what is the reward system, what are the secondary gains in not actually dealing with it. And that's why the facts are friendly matter. Uh, because what you're really trying to do is say, hey, okay, we, we, let's acknowledge the element in the room is we have this potential thing that could happen and it's super hard to solve and Effective, it could be catastrophic, and the reason we're not dealing with it is, oh, by the way, all of our revenue comes from that, right? I had this problem yesterday, it turns out, right? A discussion with my new CEO, my old partner, he's like, well, I want to run a new idea by you. And so we were talking about it. He's like, this will kill all of our current revenue, but it will kill all of our competitors. I said, the classic time problem. I said, sounds good to me. Let's go. He's like, I didn't tell you the whole thing. I, like, I got it. And he, and he walked through the whole thing. I said, I'll sleep on it, but... I think I know where we are, and we're going to suck the oxygen out of the market for anybody that thinks they can compete with us based on something like this. Um, slippery slopes, right? You've all heard this term. Well, what does it actually mean? It means that every step, in effect, is a calculated risk. Sometimes they're not conscious, but every step you take um, increases the probability that something's going to happen. And just saying, hey, look, man, that's a slippery slope. It means that every decision we take, every action we make, is likely to increase the possibility that something bad is going to happen. So if you can characterize the actual problem that you have and then look at what the decisions and actions are that are following, you can decide, you can make decisions as you go. When is it, when are you going past the point of no return? Right? When are you walking out on an overhang that's going to crack if one more person joins you? Right? And so just having that language is super helpful. Another one, um, the King Midas problem. Right? These are I, they're in a category of typically um, framed as kind of ignorance trap, something that you're doing that every time you do it, you, something great happens. And you think, well, let's do that again. Let's do that again. You hear this all the time in situations where you, go, you walk into an environment, a new environment, and you're like, oh boy, there, I can see that coming. And they're like, that's not how, I, always in the past, it has always worked. Okay, that's the past. But the thing that you, you have been doing that has been generating these rewards has some potential extremely deleterious effects, just like King Midas touching his daughter or his dinner. I can't quite figure out which is the story. And then his daughter turns or his dinner turns to gold and he can't eat it or, or take her on a walk or whatever it was. But the idea is that being clear about that things that you've done in the past and, and, and can blind you to, uh, to the possibility of what could happen in the future is, a, is another framing that makes it really useful. To, uh, to approach problem solving. A related, a related one is um, a sliding reinforcer. a much more sophisticated concept. I've used this picture because in my first startup where I was actually the CEO, I, I managed to get this guy who got his um, master's degree from Carnegie Mellon when he was 16. And he had all these really weird ass behaviors. And they were really cute when he was 16. Now he is not 16. They are not so cute. <laughs> it is much harder for him to get a date. It is much harder for him to get a job. Sliding reinforcers are things that generate a lot of um, a, a lot of positive uh, a lot of positive stuff in one context, but in a different context or in a different time, it's very predictable what will happen. And um, and so recognizing that look, that's not going to. I use this all the time just as a management thing. Like you can't take person A has very bad behavior. They think they feel very justified about having that behavior in this particular environment. 
And I look at that environment and I say, look, you may feel justified holding a gun to my head and saying that you can go off and get a job somewhere else, but I can tell you right now, if you go get a job there and do that, they're gonna fire your ass. Right? You can't take that on the road with you. So my job here is to help you see how it is that what it is you're doing isn't working for you here or anywhere else you think it might. Right? So that's just an example of a sliding reinforcer where you can, put, you can paint a quick picture for somebody about and bring the future forward for them or change context and allow them to see what's going on. Uh, externalities, right? Um, there are two types of these. One is, and I'm sorry, I'm probably totally overwhelming you with all this stuff. It's a lot of content. Um, the, the only thing you have to remember with all of these is that time matters and that uh, problems, uh, let me go back just real quick. That's the one. Time matters, right? Uh, problems exist with symptoms, problems exist with no symptoms, and potentials, and, and there, is, there is potential to have a problem, right? Just recognize that when we're talking about the present, we're not talking about the past, and we're not talking about the future. So all of these other things that I'm clicking through right now that I've been walking you through are really about how, uh, how time affects stuff. So if you have a bar, I don't know, any of you live in, a, in, a, in, a, um, in an area that doesn't get a lot of wind that, um, that may have a, you know, an atmospheric effect where a lot of smog uh, can pool, like Los Angeles Basin, which could have been blown up, but um, you know, one barbecue is not a big deal. Right? Everybody driving around in the 1970s in uh, cars that plume out the kind of pollution that they had and doing barbecues, it's a pollution problem. Right? So in, in an instance, it's not a big deal. Even in a managed set of instances, it's not a big deal. But when it gets out of control, it can become a, a significant problem just by aggregation. And uh, another version of that uh, is where um, there's a... There's a collective public interest in doing something, but the reward structure is not there for you to do something. Right? This is sort of the flip side of what I was just talking about. So I don't know if any of you have had the pleasure of running over a ladder on a freeway. It happens a lot in Texas for some reason, because I think they don't seem to recognize that tying things down in pickup truck beds is a good idea. But I have done that, and it, it really hurts. Um, it's expensive, and it's dangerous, and uh, you know, the, 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 the first public action that somebody might have done is secure what was in the back of their truck. The second public action that somebody might have done is me pulling over, removing the ladder, but cost of doing that is high should somebody run me over, right? But recognizing when one of those things is happening and that you may be making a choice and then just sort of ignoring the consequences that the person behind you is about to have is a valuable, the facts are friendly, right? I'm choosing not to pull over. I am going to now pull over and call the police, and then I'm gonna leave. <laughs> I'm not gonna get out and try to solve the problem. It just gives you a cleaner way of approaching the problem, right? Whistleblowing fits in this category. And then my very favorite, right? Sometimes some things are just mysteries, and they're better left as mysteries. Because once you unpack them, you find out there are, everything that we've talked about for the last 35 minutes is inside them. This is just a summary list of what we just talked about. Time delay problems, slippery slopes, uh, King Midas, sliding reinforcers, externalities, uh, public interest, collective problems, and mysteries. Um, I'm going to skip over this one because it's not all that impactful, even though it's all about impact. It's sort of where do you focus in the problem-solving realm. It's just pick the 20% of the 20%, right? Look for high-impact stuff and focus on the stuff that matters most there. In the problem solving process, one of the most important things is to understand what your role in it is. It's a super simple concept, right? Are you there to put out the fire? Are you there to design the next generation of chip that goes into the smoke detector? Are you there to map out and architect and install the fire suppression system? Who are you in the problem solving process, right? What is your role in it? Turns out just identifying the problem sometimes makes you the problem owner. And uh, that can be irritating. Uh, it happens to me a lot. Um, and then it's obviously super important to recognize that the problem-solving process, as we engage in it, often leads to things that we don't want. I like this picture. So before I walk you into sort of how I've applied all this in my current gig, uh, which was a result of my last gig, um, I am fully committed to everything I do, and I'm also fully open to being completely wrong. And I like this picture because you don't know whether the water's in the pool or not. And uh, 
my self-assurance, as you can probably tell, off the charts. My commitment to being right, very, very low. I think that's a very healthy, personally, I think it's a very healthy combination, right? Because it allows me to speak at the highest levels of a company, but it also allows me to approach these conversations with very little ego about whether I think I'm right or not. And I don't know, right? I can, I, one friend of mine used to say, you can be right or you can be happy. And I'm like, oh, I'd rather be happy. But I also don't want to go in and not put my point of view forward and put the facts forward and have a debate. I'm happy to do all that. But I also want to do it in a way that is, um, you know, sort of, for lack of a better way to frame it, with, without ego, right? It's without, w without being overly committed to what I believe either is true or must be true or should, should have been true. Uh, and I think it's a really helpful way of approaching the problem solving process, right? High self assurance with very, very low um, adherence to being right. So um, in summary, on the problem solving framework, I mean, anything that is to the left of predicament, you deal with it, you make a decision, you create or aim for a solution, and anything to the right of that, you set an intention and you pick a direction and you try to go, you, you try to get to a better place, right? The old way is not gonna get us to the new place, right? So being clear about the strategies that you're gonna employ and how you're gonna take those strategies and unpack them to deal with uh, a certain environment that you're in or a certain set of problems is really, really valuable. Uh, so I'm gonna change directions totally now and walk you through something that might be highly relevant for some of you, highly not relevant for others, but it does show you how all this becomes real. Because that's a lot of theory, right? So I spent the last four years at Rackspace uh, helping to build out the product organization there. It was Rackspace, for those of you who know the company, it's, a, it's the world provider in you know, managed hosting, managed cloud computing hosting solutions. And the company had a 12-year history of being kind of the, the growing behemoth in the hosting world, the dedicated hosting world, like real computers. People run their stuff on real computers. And then the cloud computing revolution happened, and um, Lou Mormon and the executive staff at at Rackspace were like, holy, you know, you know, we need to do something different. We need to invest heavily in the future of cloud computing. So they brought some colleagues that um, of, of some of us out there. I helped them sort of think through the process of joining the company. Then they brought me out there, and then four years passed. But in the process, we built a from zero to a thousand person product org and built a cloud, and compu a cloud computing platform that Rackspace now offers. Uh, and in the process of doing that, we had to build a product organization and ship almost 50 products at the same time. It was incredibly complicated, right? Understanding the environment that we were in was incredibly important and figuring out all the cultural dynamics, all the political dynamics, all the technology dynamics, all of that. I, I ended up developing a way of approaching that, which I am now applying in my current, it took us you know, three plus years to do all of that. I, I have just completed the first version of that in five weeks where I currently am. And I'm sharing with you pictures from this last five weeks, which Luke prompted me to put in. Because uh, I was telling him how, uh, what, we, what we were doing and he was like, you've got to put that in your presentation. I'm like, I don't have time. And then I, and then I realized I had, I had an hour this morning. <laughs> uh, so the idea is uh, turning theory into practice. Uh, the, the, the model that I used here, super simple. It, it was just a triangle where I was like, okay, I, I really have to understand what it is we need to do in order to, to keep going, stay in business. I really have to understand what we need to do to reinforce the foundation to grow and scale, and I really need to understand what we need to do to get to the future. And secondarily, I need to understand what do we, what's the technical debt we need to dig out of, and what do we need to automate to, uh, to make ourselves more scalable? Where are the defects in the overall experience, both internally and externally? And where are the new features and capabilities that, um, uh, that we want to, uh, to create value and, and, and capture new value in the market and bring awesome stuff to our clients and their clients? And so the idea, the idea is that you know, layer one, which is the stuff we, have to, we really have to do or it isn't going to matter, I call this uh, getting our house in order. That's people, processes, technology, all that stuff. The next was reinforcing the foundation for growth and then finally creating the future. And the idea was I went around, so I joined, I think I started the middle of October. I, I went around and I talked to everybody inside the company, all clear ID where I am now. And I just got them to walk me through, hey, what's, you know, what's working well, you know, 
what would you change? And then we use those conversations to kind of unpack, hey, you know, where, where do you see opportunities to, to sort of get to a better place? Where do you see opportunities to create new value for our customers? Where do you see things that are preventing us from doing what we're doing? Where are these things visible to our customers? Where are they only visible to us? Where are they not visible at all? So I started using this whole framework just to have these conversations, which I, and I recorded all of them, and I went back in, and I, I listened to them, and I took furious notes, and I got them to do post-its. And anyway, I filled out this triangle where the idea was anything that was in the Get Our House in Order was stuff that was required to have the business be successful in its current state. And without that, there was no real business or the business was at significant risk. And started layering all this stuff in and, uh, and then uh, turned my attention to the priorities, right? Because what I wanted to do is I wanted to say, okay, for, for technical debt, I want to understand what are the actual priorities. Well, it turns out only a handful of the things in the technical debt arena really mattered. And so those are in the lower, I didn't highlight it exactly, but in, in, in this, um, what's the geometric term for what I just drew here? Right. <laughs> in the, the lower left-hand corner, there were, I don't know, six or seven key elements of technical debt that if we did not unpack those and fix them, we were not going to be able to continue running the business at the current rate of growth. And then above that, in terms of reinforcing the foundation to scale up, there were a set of things that needed to happen there. So I needed to capture all of this, but I needed to separate the, mar the, the marble polishing from the, the actual work in order to run the business at the rate that we're running it to stop. You know, one, of the, one of the things we're trying to do is stop creating more technical debt. Right? So every time that we got another big client, we were adding more technical debt because we, were, we didn't have certain things in place that would allow us to run the business. And at some point, that's, that's not going to continue to work. And then I was, so I took all of this and I took the, you know, the technical debt, I took, um, I, I took every element that was in this chart, I went around, I said, hey, look, this is what I think this looks like now. And I explained the diagram and I said, you know, these are the elements of technical debt, these are the new features and capabilities, these are the relative priorities of them. Um, what do you think? And so it got them to adjust everything. And then I went in and I force ranked everything, so adjusted anything that was off if it was more important, it went higher. If it was less important, it went lower. Um, so using the example of technical debt here, priority one, you'll see one, two, three, four, five. So the top of that lower left-hand segment was, those were the priority ones. And you can see there's, a, there's an orange sticky and a blue one right below it. That blue one right below it, that became the first project. That meant I stopped all of my work. I turned my attention. It was priority one, which meant everything stopped. And I wrote a spec. <laughs> Go fix this. Right. This is the technical debt. This is the current state. This is the brand promise. This is how we're not delivering. This is what we're doing today. This is what needs to happen tomorrow. Here's what sufficient is. Here's what awesome is. I'm not going to take it down to the level of a, of a set of stories for you. You guys can figure that out yourself. Stop everything you're doing until this is done, other than activities you're engaged in to run the business. As soon as I had that documented, I turned back to this, and I went ahead and I built a spreadsheet out that took each of those elements and, and dropped them in, so I had one for, uh, I, I listed all the projects, and um, what I could do is pivot by goal alignment. So I could now pivot by uh, get the house in order, reinforce the foundation for growth, uh, create the future. I could also pivot by, if we stop this project, uh, we will clip our revenue. I also piv allowed, created a pivot for if we stop this project, we put the business at material risk, right? It may not be in our technical debt category. It may not be something that we've naturally identified in one of the other categories, but I had, an, I had a set of columns for, I just put an X in it, and then I sorted the, the spreadsheet by, look, if that X shows up, that means if we stop this project, if we decide not to fund it, or we pull funding from this and put it over here because we want more revenue, we're making a business decision to put the business at risk. So now all of a sudden we have a spreadsheet we can look at, anybody in the company can look at and say, oh, here are the force ranked projects per category, whether it's technical debt or whether it's automate or experience defects or whether it's new features. These are the force rankings. And now tell me whether they're high, medium, or low in your mind. I know that's what you see as the force ranking, but tell me whether you think it's important or not. And so the spreadsheet allows us to look at um, 
essentially all the decision-making criteria that we would need in order to say, okay, in order to do this, we're going to need the following resources and staff. And if we don't do this right here, that's a long fuse problem in the category of potential crisis, possibly an ELE for the business. That's a short discussion with a CEO, right? He's like, got it, okay, add people. I mean, that's how short that discussion was to hire somebody. How many times have you been involved in conversations where somebody had a really hard time justifying a hire? If you can say, if we don't do that, we put the business at risk, everybody on your executive staff agrees, you know, here, here are the elements that go into that. We need one person in order to make that happen. Done. So what we've done, I think I already explained this part, which is sort of, oh, the, 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 the notion here was that, so uh, force ranking for technical debt was from the bottom, one, two, three, four, five, and then I jumped up to the higher level category, uh, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So for technical debt, you could see everything from one to ten. And then we had high, medium, and low. Now we could sort by that. Now we could sort by uh, get our house in order. We could sort for reinforce the foundation. We could sort for revenue. We could sort for business critical. And we just look at these things, and it's a very simple conversation. That allowed us to go ahead and say, okay, if we had to do these things and sequence them out, what would headcount actually look like? So I put together a, spread, I mean, a, a, a silly PowerPoint that said, look, here's where we are with a project, green, red, yellow or if we don't know, it's a zero. Here's the, we have staff to do it, or we don't. Simple as that. Here's the project in its force ranking. Here's when it needs to happen based on its dependencies and based on when I think we can get to it. And so we're, we're now building a staffing plan based on that. And it's super simple because no longer is it everybody going, oh, wow, we need 20 people to do X, right? It's, oh, gosh, today we can do everything we have one thing at risk, and we don't know about this. We need to scope that. We actually don't need to hire anybody today. I think it's probably the first time he heard that. However, the next set of things we're going to work on, depending on how important those are to you, we're going to either have to hire a lot or we're going to have to draw a line, right? Or we're going to have to spread things out over time. And now the discussion is really very straightforward and very simple. And you can see where all this stuff fits into the innovation games paradigm as well, right? Because now, if we really, I mean, let's say we have all these grand ideas around features and capabilities and functions for getting to the future, but we haven't vetted any of this by our, our customer base, right? All of a sudden, that becomes an opportunity. Or um, there may be, uh, we may have a distributed situation where while it was easy to do this in an office with a bunch of executives, getting out to multiple offices, like in Rackspace, for example, which is a global company, may have been impossible to do. So taking all this stuff out there in, in a form that's gamified and automated and organizing this to understand what the priorities are would allow us to get to a much, much better place much, much faster. So the idea here is that getting to this required a clear understanding of the problem space for all this stuff. And it, it made it a very quick process because we could very quickly categorize things. So if we don't do this, this is how bad it is, right? Okay, you've got like two hours to go spend the money to go do that. Well, I don't, what do, you, what do you mean? I was like, well, that hasn't been done. It's an ELE. You've told me that the only thing blocking it is the limit on your credit card. Here's my credit card. Go solve it. Go to Fry's. Pick up tape backup, right? <laughs> Simple. And uh, that's the gist of sort of taking the problem framework, looking at it in terms of sort of the different categories, recognizing how these things fit over time, and then driving that into a uh, product planning and resourcing uh, process that for a small company has taken what probably would never have happened and turned it into about a month-long process where we are now uh, very clear about where we're going to be spending money. And now the only question is how much do we want to spend? So that's the gist of what it is I had to talk about from the presentation. I'm way happy to take questions. I know I'm going to drag Luke up here as well because he's going to have some perspectives on uh, all of this as, uh, as well. Yeah, one perspective. I, oh, yeah, let's give him a round. I didn't know, Harry, if you knew this, but there's actually a law called, you know, does everyone know what Brooks Law is? Brooks Law is adding programmers to a late project makes it later. Lundy's Law <laughs> is any time a programmer hits a new system, they will justify a rewrite. <laughs> 
I didn't know that. <laughs> That's awesome. Le it's Lundy's Law. Okay, um, thoughts on what you heard um, for, for Harry on this? And we, Andy and I, uh, Andy will run around and grab Dan. Did you have one? I, I don't know if your hand was. Oh, Terang. Yeah, um, it was nice to see the problem uh, framework. I uh, wonder if you've looked at what David Snowden talks about in his Kanefin framework. Yes. Because this kind of drops in there quite neatly. Yeah, so uh, Luke actually pointed me to that. And I haven't completed what I would characterize as my analysis of that. But what I'm giving you are the high level strategies. And I think he has a very effective set of smaller strategies for dealing with them once you have found them. Because what he points out are the dynamics in the problem. And then once you can identify what the dynamics are, he provides um, a, a very clear path to what do you now do? And I don't do that yet. Right, right. And, and my, my response to the Kinefin framework with, with uh, David's work, because I have been in conversation with him recently, is I don't think um, Kinefin moves you as far to the right is Harry's thinking, right? I mean, Kinefin doesn't necessarily have explicit recommendations for Quagmire and above. And I think that um, w what Harry pointed out, and I think the, the more interesting thing is the set of, the set of problems that get worse. Mm -hmm. as a, and, and Kinefin kind of doesn't allow for a, set, a class of problems that get worse. To some level. I mean, he does, he does talk about, um, you know, in, in, in that uh, ELE and, and Quagmire space, talks about how the only thing you can do is act. The only thing you can do is in order to stabilize because you don't really know how that problem is uh, going to manage. Which might be exactly the wrong thing to do. And that's the point. Okay. That's the Which, point. Yeah. So, David wants you to act. And I think acting might be the thing that causes the button to get pressed. What I'm saying is that if you hit, an e, if you hit ELE, it's stop. Look and listen. What was that? Yeah. So you remember, I, I don't know if you ever learned this as a kid, stop, look, and listen before you walk across the street. When you're at that, when you're at anything to this side of problem, stop, look, and listen. Right? It's actually slow down your action. There was a second part to this question. I, in, in your, um, in your, is that turned on? In your, um, is it, is it on? I'm not sure. Yes, it's turned Yeah. The second part was um, the, when you came up with your, the triangle, the prioritized list. Yes. Um, how, how many conversations would you say you had in order to come up with what otherwise would appear a single person prioritizing? So at Rackspace, more than 100, and at All Clear ID, probably 20 in a 50 person company? Let me reframe the question. Yeah, OK. Um, what was, how long did it take you? And how many iterations did you have on that triangle before you got to the picture that you showed us? Got it. So the picture's never done. The, the picture that you got is a point, a snapshot in time. It turned into a spreadsheet, which is a, it's a conversational document. So it's always just a point in time. It's a, it's a set of, here's what who, we believe who, is true. Who, who did you determine to be eligible to listen to in the participation of that picture? Uh, whoever said smart stuff when I was talking to them. And was it at the castle, or was it in other locations? Oh, sorry, San Antonio is their headquarters, and we call it the castle. Was it in San Antonio, or did you include other places? At Rackspace, it was global. It was global. So yeah. did you go to London, or did they come here? To, what, no, how did some you? Some of them came here. Sometimes it was just email. So, yeah, okay, so you had a distribution challenge. Yeah, Oh, a absolutely. Yeah, okay. and at Rackspace, that's why I said at Rackspace, this was a three and a half year process. I was able to run it in a local environment in one, in one place with 50 people very quickly. But in a distributed environment, had Rackspace not been such a highly collaborative culture, I don't think I ever would have been able to get there, number one. And number two is, it's a, that's an innovation games savvy environment. So. Right. Ah, OK. So you, you at one point, you were describing how you would go to the CEO, you had a conversation about, here are the projects you need to have done. And if you don't do this one, it has a material impact, whether you, know, you said revenue or you know, some it, it, it dependent on whatever it was. How yeah. did you make the connection on those projects to the point where you could actually say this one would impact the business that way? Oh, it was easy. Uh, like, that was the change in the billing system, for example, that allowed us to, uh, to uh, automate rebilling without having to have a customer service rep log in and actually do something. For, I mean, it's sort of that simple. 
There was nothing magic about it. It was all very pragmatic. So for every project, you also had what the, the, the effect to the business was that you had tagged on that project. In effect, so. yeah. Hi, Harry. Um, what kind of customer problems have you identified where no symptoms exist? I'm having a little trouble hearing you. I apologize. Is that, OK, is that, is that I, I, I okay, you're is amplified, that, but I'm having is trouble that hearing that you. So is it just thinking about the customer problems that you've come across, what can you characterize some of those where no symptoms actually exist? And what do you do about those? Are there asymptomatic or no symptom customer problems? Uh, yeah, billing problems are a great example of asymptomatic problems where the customer doesn't get a bill and the revenue keeps going down and customers are very happy until they get a bill. That's asymptomatic, in a sense, to the customer. And we had those. Okay, we got time for one more. I was interested in your discussion of the problems that weren't problems yet. How do you distinguish how you handle those versus problems that are problems today? <laughs> or, you know, I didn't know why you were doing that. You know, was there some thinking around why breaking those out specific, why so you broke I, those out? I really like that question. And the reason I really like that question is because it's all about changing people's minds. And it isn't about so much what I do differently. It's uh, in these conversations with people, it's about helping them think differently. And once people recognize that we're not talking about a problem today, that we're talking about a problem that is in the future, that hasn't happened yet, that might not happen, let's look at the things that make that true, number one, and then let's look at what's the reward system in place or the incentive system that's allowing that to be true, and then how are we implicated in that, right? So it allows us to have a very fact-based conversation with no emotion around the system that's generating this potential event in the future. And so it's really just changing the language. Harry, is that related to and I don't know if you know this term, but have you heard the term success failure from Google? Yes. Okay, is that related to a success failure? It can be. It can be. Do you guys know what success failures are? So uh, it's a failure because you got successful. And so you put something in place, um, and, and, and I can relate this to what we did at our design jam. We, had very, we have very minimal reporting structures for enterprise customers. But we didn't need to build a lot of capacity until we had enough enterprise customers. So our success has caused a failure. It's a success failure. So it's not a problem yet, right? Is that related? Right. And so when when we look at the category of, of of success failure, I would say that's probably most closely aligned to a sliding reinforcer, which is to say that the things that you're doing today are extremely effective, and there is no reason to change them. And in a new context, whether it's a temporal context, a financial context customer context or something. It simply isn't a scale context. It isn't going to work. And so the question is, do you want to deal with that in advance? Right? Google just, with the Gong Gong, I don't know if you guys heard about this uh, Gong Gong style, they actually broke the, uh, they broke the view counter for YouTube <laughs> because it was based on a 32-bit system. They never assumed the counter would go above an integer that could be calculated by a 32-bit system. That's a success failure. OK, so let me. I. I said it was one last one, but I have to add one more related to this. When you were talking about financial resources available to solve problems, did you mean to imply that if we just threw money at it, it would go away? Um, not necessarily. In some cases, uh, it makes the difficulty to solve, it decreases the difficulty to solve. Okay. He gave me another question. So I'm, I'm it's my birthday. La. OK, my birthday question is, I have only one, so. Um, your comment about what, what rewards are in place that are keeping us doing things the way yep. we've already done the it. Incentive structure and or secondary We've talked games. about how context changes, and you have to look at how you're doing things against the new context. But what kind of examples of incentives you've, have you seen in place, whether they were fixed or not, that caused something to not get fixed or not get managed or not get planned for um, because the incentive, the reward structure was, was incenting a different kind of behavior. Can you give an example? Yeah, the, of that? the best one that I can think of uh, is actually something that we started to solve at Rackspace. Uh, I identified, in going through this process at Rackspace, I identified there were a set of things that were happening where new 
product development was taking place outside of the scope of any of our processes and couldn't figure out why or how it was happening. And so I wound it back up to the sales team and I found out that sales was selling big deals and making commitments that put pressure on the development teams to do uh, proofs of concept and cut technology deals to enable uh, the company to sell to very big clients. Uh, and so we were getting paid a little bit, but promises of huge rewards from the sales team to do this stuff, and it was sucking up. It was like black development, like it was a dark development. It was happening and consuming amount, lots of resource. We didn't understand, we didn't even know it was happening. And then we found out it was happening. Then we found out why it was happening. And so in, we didn't actually stop it, but what we did is we put process in place in order to, to counterbalance it. Yeah, yeah. All right, great, great. Thank you so yeah. much. Thanks.